Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of POMED's Between the Lines author interview series. I'm Amy Hawthorne, Deputy for Director for Research here at POMED, and I'm thrilled to welcome as our guest, my colleague and friend, Dr. Hashem Salem. Dr. Salem is Associate Director and Research Scholar at the Program on Arab Reform and Democracy at the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. That's a mouthful. <laughs> what a title. <laughs> Welcome, Hisham. Uh, we're here today to discuss the new book, Struggles for Political Change in the Arab World, Regimes, Oppositions, and External Actors After the Spring, that you've co-edited with your Stanford colleagues, Dr. Amr Hamzawi and Dr. Lisa Blades. And this volume was published by the University of Michigan Press last fall. And as we know, there has been so much ink spilled about the Arab uprisings at this point that there would hardly seem to be a need for yet another study and another volume. But this book, Hisham, is exceptionally good and really adds to our understanding of these seminal events that continue to reverberate across the Arab region um, until today. And I personally learned so much from this book. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy, for your kind and generous words. And Struggles for Political Change has also re received terrific reviews. Foreign Affairs described the book as, quote, an unusually strong collection showcasing writing by some of the best scholars working on politics in the Arab world today, all of them at the top of their game a thorough and sophisticated examination of political change and contestation after the 2011 uprisings. One other great feature of this book is it's available in open access for free and it can be downloaded on Amazon at no cost. So there's no excuse for everyone not reading this book. Everyone should read it because it's excellent and it's free. With that introduction, Hisham, let's dive into a conversation about this really valuable volume. Um, my first question, Hashem, in the introduction to the book, you and your co-editors write that the common narrative about a first round of the Arab Spring, meaning the 2011 uprisings in Tunisia, Egypt, Bahrain, Libya, Syria, Yemen, and then followed by a second round of the 2019 uprisings in Algeria, in Lebanon, in Sudan, that this narrative this sort of description is wrong. So why is this narrative about these two rounds wrong? And what is a more accurate way of, of talking about or understanding these events? Uh, thank you very much, Amy. I'm uh, really delighted at the opportunity to chat with you and to engage with your many uh, followers and many admirers. <laughs> uh, so uh, in order to answer your question, I think it's important to explain the context in which this volume was produced. As you know, the uh, this book is an outgrowth of uh, Stanford University's program in Arab Reform and Democracy's research on emerging trends in authoritarian governance in the Arab world, as well as the challenges confronting advocates of democratic change in the region. Uh, and more specifically, the idea for this volume was uh, conceived at a conference that we held here on campus in October 2019. The theme of the meeting centered on how regimes, oppositions, and international actors adapted in the wake of the Arab uprisings. But the plot twist, Amy, is that we were convening at the backdrop of a fresh wave of popular mobilization that was sweeping the region at the time, including the revolution in Algeria, which resulted in the ouster of Abdelaziz Bouteflika, the uh, revolution in Sudan, which ended 30 years of Omar al-Bashir's rule, the October 17th revolution in Lebanon, and the profound impact that it had on the politics of the country, and the uprising in Iraq, which uh, brought down the government of mm -hmm. Adel al That is to say, we were living through a moment in which uh, that um, Arab winter narrative was beginning to fall apart, or the claim that the Arab uprisings of 2011 were completely defeated and that Arab autocrats emerged triumphant in the absolute sense was a narrative we could no longer accept uncritically. Mm -hmm. And that was definitely uh, one of the uh, you know complexities we're contending with because that gets at the issue that you know this narrative of absolute failure, uh, you know, doesn't capture the extent to which the struggles, the social imbalances and disparities, the structural economic realities that were all reflected in the 2011 uprisings remained alive and well nearly a decade since the onset of the so-called Arab Spring, as some people like to call it. So 
in contending with that complexity, we as a research community uh, had to uh, let go of these narratives of success and failure. And instead, we just needed to study the politics and political realities of these countries on their own terms. The other complexity that we were contending with here is the fact that the uprisings we observed in 2019 did not emerge out of vacuum and were very much connected to previous waves of popular mobilization. Some of them date back to 2011, if not even uh, before then, right. which, um, you know, uh, and it is in that sense, uh, of course, that uh, that need and clean binary between a first and second wave of Arab uprisings uh, doesn't, uh, you know, uh, serve to be analytically useful all the time, because it doesn't take into consideration the long view, it doesn't uh, take into consideration the long standing and enduring uh, connections and links between successive waves of popular mobilization, and most importantly, the process of learning and adaptation that happens across these various waves of, uh, of mobilization, which is one of the major themes that this volume was trying to bring to focus. Absolutely. I think the, uh, I mean, we'll get to this later in our conversation, but the multidimensional approach that this volume takes looking at um, these political processes from many, many dimensions and across time is, is really, really valuable. Um, I'd like to ask you next about the book's title. And I noticed that it has the word struggles, plural for political change in the Arab world. And that caught my eye. Um, can you tell me uh, and our audience about why you and your co-editors chose to make that word plural? So um, the term struggles here, Amy, is supposed to capture uh, and evoke the open-endedness of the conflicts uh, that were embodied by the Arab uprisings and its aftermath. Uh, so to be kind of more specific and to give you an example, you know, the uh, certainly, yes, uh, uh, progressive political activists and movements have suffered enormous losses uh, after the Arab uprisings in the wake of multiple waves of repression that followed those uprisings, but their struggles uh, to push back and to resist continues. Uh, some authoritarian regimes may have uh, succeeded in the relative sense in the short run in containing the immediate threats that were posed by these uprisings after uh, 2011, but their struggles to reimpose political order and to really rebuild and reinvent the facade of participatory politics that existed prior to 2011 continues and remains largely inconclusive. So, um, you know, in other words, uh, the term we invoke the term struggles in the title um, to try to shift the focus of analysis from static, discrete outcomes. Uh, to open-ended processes that are constantly changing and constantly evolving. Absolutely. And that theme comes through in the book, you know, very, very well in all of the chapters in, in a different way. Um, my next question, Hashem, is, is about the organization of the book. It's organized very usefully for the reader into three distinct thematic sections. And I'd like to ask you a bit about each one in turn. So the first section is about Arab regimes and their strategies of political control uh, during and following the 2011 uprisings. Tell us, you know, what are some of the most important themes that emerge in this section about how many, not all, but many of these Arab authoritarian regimes survived, survived in the face of huge pressures from their populations uh, for, for political change, for democratic change? Well, uh, you know, the first section of the volume brings to focus five country studies, including one on Egypt by Amr Hamzawi, one on Morocco by Samir Razouki, on Kuwait by Farah Naqib, on uh, Saudi Arabia by Michael Herb, and then Syria by Samir Abu. So beyond the empirical richness and particularities that each of these chapters offers, I think there are three major cross-cutting themes that I should highlight here. Mm -hmm. The first is the increasing reliance on repression across the board throughout the countries uh, of the region, having either experienced or witnessed the turbulence of popular mobilization of the Arab uprisings. Many authoritarian rulers have since resorted to these highly aggressive repressive tactics to try to preempt any potential encores of 2011. And the most flagrant 
uh, example of that trend, you guessed it, is Egypt, mm -hmm. as Amr Hamzawi tells us in his it's chapter. Excellent, uh, excellent chapter, yes. And absolutely, and 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 as Amr notes, uh, the country witnessed the complete closure of political space in uh, 2013. And uh, as you know, uh, Amy, the regime of Abdel Fattah al-Sisi has shown incredible levels of brutality in using deadly violence and politically motivated prosecutions against dissidents from across the ideological spectrum. And after a couple of years of relative political openness that followed Mubarak's downfall in 2011, political space in Egypt today remains heavily policed and heavily regulated. In Syria, uh, you know, uh, repression has taken on additional layers, as Samir Abboud tells us in his chapter, beyond the tremendous amounts of violence that the regime of Bashar al-Assad and his supporters have used against their opponents, the government has employed uh, a variety of these legal instruments, including anti-terrorism laws to try to suspend the economic rights and property rights of the regime's suspected opponents and to just freeze their assets. And in many cases, Amy, the lands that were seized by the government under these laws were redistributed to the regime's own uh, supporters. The second trend that I want to highlight here is the decline in liberalized autocracy as a model of authoritarian governance in the Arab world. By way of of context here, liberalized autocracy was the dominant authoritarian template on the rise in the Arab world prior to 2011. Scholars, most notably my friend and former dissertation advisor, Dan Brumberg, used that term to describe the tendency of Arab autocrats to allow for some limited political space and some limited liberties and to erect this facade of a democratic process through state-managed political competition. In simpler terms, authoritarian rulers were there to stay and we all knew about that, but they showed some willingness to cut parliament some slack, to allow for some competition during election seasons, and to allow for some criticism of the government and the media. Except that way of doing business, Amy, uh, has been uh, you know, di dissipating, and that template of liberalized autocracy seems to have been on the decline since 2011, and that is because, as you know, authoritarian regimes have uh, become uh, more closed, more repressive, less tolerant of dissent, and less inclined to delegate power to elected institutions, even to the most limited degrees. So here you find, like even in countries that used to have parliaments with some meaningful, even if limited powers, such as in Kuwait and Morocco, rulers have been circumventing these institutions through a variety of legal maneuvers. And I think, Amy, the case of uh, Morocco is important to showcase here, because as you recall, at a certain point in time, uh, you know, you remember uh, Morocco used to be the poster child of liberalized autocracy. And yet now, Samir Razouki's chapter is documenting how the regime has become much more reliant on coercion uh, in uh, dealing with uh, political dissidents and how the palace has continued uh, uh, and has become more aggressive in, in encroaching upon the powers of elected institutions, most notably parliament. In other words, Arab rulers are showing less interest in erecting that facade of democracy uh, compared to the pre-Arab uprisings years. Right. At a, a broader level, Amy, I think this speaks to the idea that the very experiences of the Arab uprisings has, uh, you know, has made these uh, autocrats much more distrustful of nominally democratic institutions, even if these institutions are only there just for show. And that is because they've come to believe that any political opening, however limited, could lead to a a repeat of the 2011 uprisings, right. which is exactly the encore they've been trying so intently on preempting for the past 11 years. So that is to say on the second point, uh, the volume is trying to show the and trace the slow death uh, that this template of liberalized autocracy has been undergoing uh, for uh, the past decade. The final trend that I wanna highlight, at least for the purposes of that section, is increasing personalism. And that trend mm -hmm. speaks in part to the rise of, uh, you know, Amy, the cults of personalities around uh, populist authoritarian rulers such as Abdel Fattah al-Sisi in Egypt, Pai Said in uh, Tunisia, and arguably even uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed yes. bin Salman, also known as MBS. But besides that, I do think that that trend also speaks to this notion that the distribution of power inside of autocratic regimes has become much more centralized than it used to be. 
And here, I think Michael Herb's chapter on Saudi Arabia is just very enlightening on this point. He analyzes how the role of Al Saud in more recent years has become much more centered on the person of the Crown Prince MBS, and that these long-standing traditions of power sharing between prominent branches of the ruling family seem to be slowly dissipating. Farah al Naqib documents a related but not identical trend in Kuwait, where she notes how Al Sabah family have been. Um, you know, slowly moving away from uh, these quote unquote norms of rule by consensus in the way the family shares or fails to share power with the elected parliament. So the story in a nutshell, Amy, is that authoritarian regimes are becoming more closed, more repressive, uh, more centralized, if not more personalized. Yes, you know, Hashem, um, the, all of the chapters in, the, in that section are really excellent. Um, just to say a sentence about Dr. Michael Herb's chapter, it was one of the most kind of interesting analyses that I've read about how uh, Mohammed bin Salman sort of came to power um, in Saudi Arabia. And uh, just as you said, like this, this trend of moving from rule by consensus to personalized centralized rule, which in my view, and I think you would probably agree, over the longer term poses, you know, real dangers of instability for these regimes. But at least in the short term, this is like the tactic that they've taken. Um, and just a small note, Amy, yes. you know, uh, Mike wrote that chapter or drafted that chapter and, uh, you know, well before uh, MBS was actually, and it was actually published and released well before MBS was appointed prime minister. Uh, in Saudi Arabia. So, so I think he really he understood the dynamics inside the regime, you know, better than a lot of other analysts, because he really explains, um, I think, in a very interesting and important way, uh, how, how Mohammed bin Salman managed to rise to and consolidate his power, which um, obviously has had a huge impact, <laughs> not just on Saudi politics, but, you know, for the whole region. Um, the second section of the book, um, it shifts, the perspective shifts, the focus of analysis shifts from regimes to political oppositions. Um, and it looks at the mobilization strategies and the obstacles that these opposition movements have faced. And there are also some very interesting findings in this section. So I was wondering if you could, you know, maybe highlight one or two or three of the main themes from, from that section of the book about sort of the bottom up, the oppositions that are struggling for change in this region. So here, as far as this section is concerned, I think the story becomes much more interesting when we turn to this question of how have opposition movements and actors adapted in the wake of the Arab uprisings. And here, Amy, we find that it's not just authoritarian rulers who have lost faith in quote unquote liberalized autocracy and state managed political competition, but opposition movements and actors have also lost faith in these political institutions and processes, and most importantly, in their transformative potential. You find this idea in nearly every chapter in this section, which includes an intervention on Jordan by Sean Yom, one on Lebanon by Dina Khatib. Well, med non-resident fellow, let me just add, Dr. Sean Yes, Yom. It's giving I'm him sorry. a little shout out. Yes. Sorry, sorry. continue. <laughs> and uh, on uh, Algeria by Thomas Serre on uh, Iraq by David Patel, on Sudan by Khaled Mustafa Madani, on uh, Tunisia by Lindsay Binstead, and uh, finally on Yemen by April Longley Ali. And uh, I think the key uh, trend to highlight here, Amy, to your question is uh, the growing tension between formal organized politics and contentious politics. So what do I mean by formal organized politics? I mean state managed uh, elections as well as elite led political parties and legislatures. By contentious politics, I'm primarily referring to the protest movements that rose to surface in the wake of the Arab uprisings mm -hmm. and the years that followed. So in almost single one of those chapters, Amy, you find some manifestation of the tensions between those two different spheres of politics. Mm -hmm. You see it in Jordan, where Sean Yom talks about how protest movements have refused to collaborate with uh, opposition political parties. These movements have also refused to build uh, formal organizational structures based on vertical lines of authority accountability. And uh, you find a similar uh, story in uh, in uh, Lebanon, Perlina Khatib's chapter, which in part zeroes in on the animosity between established political parties and uh, various waves of protest movements since 2015, 
Uh, David Patel tells a similar story in Iraq where he yeah. highlights the tensions between the protest movements that led the uprisings in 2019 and formal political organizations. Uh, the same uh, pattern resonates in Algeria. Thomas Serg explains how the Haraq movement that brought down Bouteflika's rule uh, have been reluctant uh, to collaborate with uh, formal political parties. The Haraq has also kept its distance from the elections and the military managed transition uh, more generally. The only curious exception to that trend you find in Sudan, where Khalid Madani's chapter uh, notes a much more collaborative relationship mm -hmm. between horizontally organized uh, protest movements and vertically uh, organized uh, political parties, uh, unions, and uh, and organizations. Uh, but either way, I think the implications of the tensions between uh, contentious and formal politics are so uh, profound and important because mm. they arguably help us understand why is it that protest movements throughout the region since 2011 have been successful in bringing down governments and authoritarian rulers, but have been less successful in negotiating the terms of the transitions and political orders that followed such. Right. And that is because, you know, these movements more often than not tend to lack the leadership and organizational structures to be able to secure a credible seat in the formal political arena, which, as you know, Amy, tends to be dominated by the organized political elites and not by the highly uh, fragmented and decentralized agents of popular mobilization right. and protest movements that are usually organizing through these loose, informal, horizontal networks. Um, there are two other uh, findings that I want to highlight really yeah. quickly. The, the first concerns a major obstacle that's facing many advocates of progressive change in the region, uh, unresolved questions about statehood and national identity, an issue that loomed large in April Longley Ali's chapter on Yemen's post-2012 yes. uh, uh, transitional framework, why it collapsed and what went wrong. The other is just the... Uh, you know, general sense of popular distrust towards national political institutions as a result of ineffective governance or poor economic performance. Uh, Lindsay Binstead explains how this issue greatly challenged Tunisia's post-2011 uh, transition and arguably paved the way yes. to the executive coup that was conducted by Qais Saeed right. in uh, 2021. Yes, it's very, um, I mean, again, all of the chapters in that section are excellent. I read uh, Lindsay Benstead's chapter on Tunisia with um, a sense of, I mean, it very insightful, but also a feeling of, you know, we all, or so many of us saw this coming, but yet somehow it was still a shock when Qaisaid seized power in the way that he did, but so many of the danger signs were there. Um, Hisham, the books third section moves to yet a different locus of analysis, which is also fascinating. And it's something that um, I think it's one of the most interesting treatments of this theme um, in the literature on the Arab uprisings. And the third section is about transnational influences. So mm -hmm. the role of the United States, China, Turkey, uh, those external players, and certain Arab governments that are, of course, you know, not external players, they're part of the Arab system. But um, they're projecting influence beyond their borders to try to shape political outcomes um, in other countries in the Arab world. Um, what can you tell us about, you know, the main findings of this section, which I, again, I found very, very interesting. So, um, you know, on one level, I think this section is trying to bring to focus the um, international and regional conditions that allowed the Arab world to once again become a safe haven for autocracy yeah. after the uh, turbulence of uh, the Arab uprisings. Uh, so Toby Matheson analyzes the rise of the counter-revolutionary axis that's led by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates with right. the goal of subverting any movement towards democracy uh, or uh, elections in the countries of the region, in part to prevent the rise of unfriendly governments that are not going to serve their interests, and in part to prevent the diffusion of the Arab uprisings into their own societies. Uh, but this is not just the doing of regional powers. The United States is in fact part and parcel of that democracy prevention effort. The rise of the Donald Trump administration and President Trump's own warm embrace of 
uh, repressive autocrats in the region is something that cannot be ignored as suggested by Sarah Yerkes' chapter. Right. Uh, a related and important issue uh, is um, or has to do with the growing ties, economic ties, I should say, uh, between China and various autocratic governments in the Arab world, as documented by Visa Blades' chapter. Mm -hmm. And that trend, of course, raises the question of whether these increasing ties, uh, you know, down the line are going to afford some authoritarian rulers greater leeway yes. in um, embarking upon uh, uh, repressive initiatives domestically without having to worry about the consequences of the international backlash. Uh, on a different level, I think, uh, you know, this section uh, is also uh, highlighting uh, the shifts in uh, strategies and how regional powers have sought to influence the domestic politics of Arab countries. And here Abbas Milani shows how Iran in more recent years has been increasingly relying on uh, you know, its ideological power in exerting influence over its neighbors as distinct, of course, from its uh, proxy military engagement, right. which we all know about. Uh, and then Aicha Adem Daratlu and uh, Gunal Tol, uh, you know, they, they note how uh, in recent times, Turkey has shown an inclination to enter into military adventurism in uh, the Arab world after a long period of time in which Turkey's approach and foreign policy towards the Arab region was, uh, for the most part, uh, framed around uh, soft power projections. Right. Uh, finally, Hisham, you know, this book is, um, this edited volume is not, um, surprisingly, it's, it's a pretty, unsurprisingly, it's a pretty sobering read. Um, but what makes you, as a scholar and an analyst of this region, what makes you feel optimistic or hopeful today about the struggle for democratic rights and freedoms in the Arab world against all of the obstacles and challenges that this book, um, you know, lays out so well? What makes you feel hopeful? So let me let me preface my answer by saying the following. I, mean, okay. I think that the political realities in the Arab world do not lend themselves to a lot of optimism. You know, state-led repression uh, has reached unprecedented levels of brutality and activists uh, across the region are, are operating under highly limiting political environments. That said, that doesn't mean that Arab autocrats have gained the upper hand in the absolute sense. As a matter of fact, you know, and you know this, Amy, like, you know, more uh, than 10 years since the onset of the Arab uprisings and many authoritarian rulers are reckoning with their own vulnerabilities, are mm -hmm. reckoning with their own failure to address popular discontent at poor economic performance and non-inclusive and exclusionary forms of economic growth. Uh, that is to say that the popular yearning or more accountable, uh, more responsive, more inclusive, more just governance is still alive. And for as long as that yearning mm -hmm. is alive, I think we could say that the region will never be a completely safe haven for uh, autocracy. But more importantly than that, Amy, if, even if the realities that are highlighted in this volume do not lend themselves to a whole lot of optimism, that is not to say that the Arab world is somehow devoid of hope or devoid of inspiring stories of individuals who are still refusing to take no for an answer and are still pushing for progressive yes. social change in spite of all of the obstacles and challenges that we just talked about. And I think the year 2019 is a really important case in point. And I mean, let's, let's think about this. Let's meditate on this for a second. What are the countries that experienced uprisings in 2019? We're talking about Iraq, Algeria, Sudan, and Lebanon, a group of countries that suffered from decades of either autocratic or corrupt rule, yes. a set of countries that uh, you know, saw firsthand the horrors of civil wars, mm -hmm. foreign invasions, military occupations, and in one case, secession. And yet, in spite of all of these hardships and national traumas, people were still able to imagine and demand a better future. People still believed that a more just, and a more inclusive social and political order is within reach. And that in and of itself is something to pause at, to contemplate, to study, and maybe even to celebrate regardless of what will become of these uprisings in the long run. And I think that is one thing that no sobering piece of scholarship, however nuanced, could possibly take away. Thank you so much, Hisham, for injecting that moment of hope. And um, I, I do very much agree with you. The, the most 
um, courageous and inspiring and brave people I know are those very people in the Arab world who are continuing this struggle um, to this day against incredible odds. So that is something that we always have to remember. I couldn't and agree more. Keep keep in our thoughts. Um, thank you so much, Hisham. I've been here with Hish Dr. Hisham Salam, co-editor of the uh, new of October 2022 volume from University of Michigan Press, Struggles for Political Change in the Arab World. Op regimes, oppositions, and exter external actors after the spring. Thank you so much, Hisham. Thank you very much, Amy. Pleasure to chat with you.